this soul has been here for 33 years. Originally it was intended to last only five years. When I joined the monastery in 1991, the cell had just come up. And the people who were responsible for it had wanted to make the point that no, they hadn't asked permission from the county. And it was up to me to talk to the county, to make the county accept the fact that we put up a temporary building like this. And they wanted to prove that the, the intention was temporary. And so they put it on very weak foundations. It was just sitting on top of a couple of concrete blocks. Well, the county was not impressed. And after some negotiation, we decided that we would put in more solid foundations and leave the cellar here until the time came to tear it down, the plan being that we would get a more permanent building. And here we are, 33 years later. The decision has been made that it has to be demolished to make room for the new cellar. Makes you stop and think. Thirty-three years. If the walls could talk, what would they say? The most important things they would say would be the talks that John Swart gave, conversations, formal talks, during the first five years when he was here. The themes that he stressed over and over again were ones that he said that a John Mun tended to stress in his Dharma talks. One was practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma, and the other was the customs of the Noble Ones. In a John Mun's day, we tend to think of the forest tradition as being quintessentially Thai, but a John Mun was accused of not behaving in line with Thai customs. Living in the forest, eating out of his bowl, being very strict about the vinaya. But as he said, if you want to be a noble one, you have to practice by the customs of noble ones and not by the customs of any particular country. Because every country's customs are put together by people of defilements. The customs of the noble ones give us an idea of what the values of the noble ones are, and if you adopt their values, then you're on the right track. In the canon, they list four. Contentment with food, clothing, shelter. You're content with what you get. You don't struggle to get more. And at the same time, you don't exalt yourself or disparage others, or with the fact that you are more content than they are. That line makes you think about that article that appeared in The Onion. Had a contest among meditating monks to see who could be the most serene. And the winner of the contest is shown raising his arms up in victory. We're not here to compete with others. We're here to compete with our own defilements, our own greed, our own pride. So we learn to use the requisites of life. Not to stoke our greed or stoke our pride, but to be content with what we have so that we can focus on the areas where we are not content. This has to do with the fourth of those customs and noble ones, which is to delight in abandoning and to delight in developing. In other words, you delight in abandoning unskillful qualities and you delight in developing skillful ones, like right now as you're meditating. You want to delight in being with the breath. You want to delight in getting past your distractions. This requires a change in attitude. When, when unskillful things come up, you're not content. There's that line of thought that says, well, if you try to get rid of your unskillful mental qualities, that's engaging in craving for non-becoming, it's showing aversion. Well, there are times when you have to be averse to things that are unskillful. If you let unskillful qualities stay, they're going to take over. 
and you're missing out on the basic principles of right effort. If something unskillful has arisen, you try to get rid of it, and you're trying to prevent it from arising. As for skillful qualities, if they're not there yet, you try to give rise to them, and then you try to maintain them. So if you find yourself wandering off away from the breath, you try to bring yourself back. And then as you stay here, you try to strengthen your focus. This is one of the reasons why we work with getting the breath comfortable, trying to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in and breathe out. Notice where the breath is flowing well, notice where it's not flowing well. And where it's not flowing well, what can you do to open up the channels that allow it to flow? You don't have to push it. And John Lee has a good image. He says it's like cutting roads through the wilderness. Things get connected, and when you build a road, you don't have to push the cars down the road. The cars will come, and they'll, the road is there, and it's smooth. They'll go on their own. The same way, you open up the channels, think of things relaxing wherever there's tension, and the breath will flow. You don't have to push it. And once it's there, you try to maintain it. So that's a fourth custom of the Noble Ones, delighting in abandoning, delighting in developing. And it's all in line with the Buddhist principle when he said that one of the secrets to his awakening was, one, not giving up on his efforts, and two, not resting content with the skillful qualities he had. This is one area where he actually advised discontent. If things aren't good enough in the mind, what can you do to make them better? Because you do have that power. Now all of this assumes that other principle, practicing the Dharma in the line with the Dharma. The Buddha talks about the fact that we're training the mind in virtue, concentration, discernment, or what he calls heightened virtue, heightened mind, heightened discernment. And even though to one extent the Buddha is our trainer. He's not here right now. You have to internalize his instructions, internalize his values, which means that part of your mind is the trainer and part of the mind is being trained. As he says, you listen to the Dharma, you contemplate it, you decide that it makes sense, and that gives rise to a desire to practice. When you have that desire to practice, then there's a willingness, in other words, to take on the Buddhist standards. And then you judge what's going on in your mind. We're often told that we're trying to develop a non-judging state of mind. The Buddha never said that. I mean, how are you going to know what's skillful and what's not skillful unless you pass judgment? But you have to have a healthy, mature attitude both in the judging and in receiving the judgments. In doing the judgment, remember, your purpose is to judge a work in progress. And they're coming to a final verdict on whether you are a worthy meditator or not. You take it for granted that things can be improved. And the question is, how do you do it? How do you recognize when something is not up to standard? And how do you encourage yourself to bring it up to standard? And you remember that the Buddha's purpose in establishing these standards, the duties of the Four Noble Truths, was compassionate. And the whole purpose of the Four Noble Truths is to help you put an end to suffering. If you want to put an end to suffering, then he says, this is what you've got to do. You've got to comprehend suffering, abandon the cause. Develop the path so that you can realize the cessation of suffering. Those are all compassionate duties. And as I said, he's not imposing them on you. As he realized, he wasn't in a position to impose anything on anybody. He wasn't anybody's father or creator. But he was experienced. As you saw, this is how causality works. If you want to work it to your advantage, this is what you've got to do. 
So part of the mind accepts those standards. That's the willingness to take them on. And it's got to look at the other part. The other part has to be willing to listen. You'll have parts of the mind that say, I'd rather find a pleasure right now rather than the pleasures of the practice. Something easier, something more familiar. You have to question it. Why? Is life as you've lived it so far satisfactory? Is it good enough? This is where that principle of not resting content with what you've got, the good things you've got, you realize that Third Noble Truth tells you there's something better. There's a state of mind where there is no suffering, that it can be attained through your efforts. So the judgments are there with a compassionate motive, and if you receive those judgments without understanding, it's a lot easier to take them. We read about some of the Ajahns in Thailand who were quite strict with their students. And there were some people who just dismissed them as being aversive. But that's missing the point. They had found that they had to be strict with themselves in order to get the most out of the practice. Their being strict with others, it was their way of showing compassion. They don't rest content. There's more, there's better. And when you get to the point where you've reached what's really better, and then you can put down your tools. This work in progress, it's, probably progress, it's finally progressed to the point where it's done. But until it's done, remember you're on a path, and it's easy to wander off the path. You wander off the path, and what happens? The Buddha's image is of a cart that wanders away from a main road, gets on a rough road, the axle breaks, the wheels get twisted, and you can't go anywhere. So you want to do your best to stay on the road. Practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. That can mean two things. One is you don't try to change the Dharma to suit your ideas. This gets back to that issue of the customs of the noble ones. You delight in developing, you delight in abandoning, in line with the Buddhist standards. We're not here to follow American customs or Brazilian customs or whatever customs. What brings us together is practicing the customs of the noble ones. That's one meaning. The other meaning is that you practice for the sake of disenchantment and dispassion. Now that may sound gray and dull, but the Buddha always equates dispassion with release, freedom. We keep fabricating our experience in the old ways that we're familiar with, and even though we may not think that we're passionate about it, we are stuck in our ways. And that's the kind of passion. And that's when we realize that we can be freed from our old bad habits. And a good analogy is seeing a game that you used to play as a child. It fascinated you, it challenged you. But then you get to the point when you realize you've seen all that game has to offer, like tic-tac-toe. You finally realize where you put the X's and the zeros, so that you, at least you never lose, and there's no more challenge. It doesn't pull you, it doesn't tie you down, it doesn't waste your time anymore. You're freed from it. That's what the practice of the Dharma is for, to free ourselves from our old habits, which of course isn't going to mean stirring up a lot of your old habits, questioning them. But that's what the quality of willingness is all about, and the judgment we're passing is all about.
so that we can arrive at the truth. To see what the Buddha said about suffering is really true. It is possible to experience the end of suffering in a way that's never going to let you down. So those are some of the teachings we would get from Ajahn Sawat. This building, even though it's now destined for demolition, has seen a lot of good things. But the fact that it's going to be demolished teaches us another lesson that things don't last forever. The opportunity to practice doesn't last forever. So take advantage of the opportunity that you have right now, our hope is to replace this building with a new one. But who knows? War may come, economic collapse may come, we may find that the situations for practice may be more difficult. So take advantage of the, the ease we have right now. But also learn that no matter how ease or easeful or difficult it is, this is a practice that's always worth doing. And this is why it's been transplanted here in the West. It's not just an Asian value or an Asian custom. As John Swat said, we're not here to force everybody to be Thai. We're here to practice the customs of the noble ones so that we can become noble as well. And those are principles that are true when the practice is easy, and they're true when the practice is difficult. They're applicable everywhere and always. <laughs>